lectures about reproduction, the birds and the bees, if you will, if you haven't had that talk with your parents, this probably isn't the a good substitute. Um, so I would call them immediately and ask him about it. But um, <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, we will speak of reproduction, biologically speaking, which is the purpose of life, to have your genes represented in the next generation. So what we'll do is we'll talk about asexual and sexual reproduction, and then talk about plant and animal reproduction. So asexual reproduction is... Um, only requiring one individual to reproduce, where they make an exact copy of themselves, um, essentially a clone. Um, sexual reproduction involves two gametes, or sex cells, to make a genetically unique organism, a combination of the two um, donors, the donors of the sex cells, make a genetically unique organism. So uh, asexual reproduction, uh, this is my family picture, if I asexually reproduced, um, all of my progeny would look exactly like me, just at different stages of development. Um, sexual reproduction allows for genetic recombination, which is why you don't look exactly like one of your parents. Uh, most organisms reproduce asexually. Some can do both. Um, most plants and animals can reproduce sexually. It doesn't mean that's their main mode. Um, generally it is, but some plants are mostly asexual. We'll talk about the differences between the two. So asexual reproduction, the characteristics of it, it's you have one parent cell or one parent organism which copies its genes and produces the exact copy to their offspring. There's no fusion of gametes. There's no gametes involved, so you don't have sperm or egg. And it gives rise to a genetically identical identical clone um, and the only difference might be through mutation so maybe there is slight differences between them but it's only through mutation through errors in replication errors in the process of making those genes and passing them on to the next generation not in genetic recombination the advantages why would you um, want to be asexual um, as an organism, or in what environment would this reproductive mode be favored, um, is that it doesn't require another individual. So you can be stranded on a deserted island and um, repopulate that island through, or populate that uh, island through asexual reproduction. Um, it's well suited so that individuals can make exact replicas of each other and it's favored in areas that have stable, condi stable conditions. So if the conditions are all the same, if the environment is not variable, um, and you are a fit individual and are well suited for your environment, it's better that you just make exact copies of yourself um, than all of your progeny will also be well suited for the environment. So thus, the progeny are fit, the final point. All right, so you have a grasshopper. It finds this um, ecosystem full of grass. The, grass is, the grasshopper is really good at eating the grass. It can produce a bunch of clones of itself, and all of the clones will be good at eating the grass as well. Right? All right, asexual reproduction disadvantages are all of the <clears throat> progeny or all the population are going to be genetically identical. So they're all susceptible to the same things. So this can lead to disastrous consequences if you have a change in the environment which selects against uh, the traits of the individual. So an example of this was in the 1970s, corn was subject to a fungus which um, you know, caused it to not be able to produce the corn that we eat in, in the United States. Um, and this was called a blight, so the corn blight in the 1970s. And essentially, 85% of all corn in the U.S. was the same type, had the same genetics, um, was clones of each other. And so when this blight came through, it devastated the corn industry. It was all killed, transferred very easily, killed um, most of it. And in order to save it, we had to actually go back to some disease-resistant 
crops um, and breed in new disease resistant traits. Some of the things have happened with uh, potatoes. There was a potato blight, which also killed, um, which also devastated a potato famine throughout the world, specifically had its effects in Ireland. So going back to the grasshopper, let's say a new predator arrives and it um, finds your traits appealing and is very easily um, able to capture and eat um, you and the like representatives in your population that are all clones of each other. Um, it will easily, you know, be able to um, kill off you and your progeny because you're all the same. All right, so sexual reproduction, reproduction on the other hand, uh, involves two individuals which contribute one gamete each, a uh, sperm and an egg, to make an offspring. The offspring then don't have, they, since they just have half of the genes from their mother and half from their father, and it's a new combination, they are unique. Um, the mixing of chromosomes and genes on the chromosome is the main mechanism for variation, which occurs through meiosis, right? Crossing over, uh, independent assortment, segregation, all those things we studied in Bio 1. So this is why you don't look like your parents or why my kids don't look exactly like me but look like some sort of combination between uh, my wife and I. Mutation, which also affects asexual reproduction, will also affect sexual reproduction. Um, so it's an additive variation to that. So some advantages to it are that it produces more variation. So if you have a variable environment, um, the different types or the different variants within your species can inhabit different slightly different habitats, right? The progeny are not all similarly susceptible to, let's say, that predator or let's say that disease. Uh, and so if a disease comes through, some of them will survive and be resistant. Um, sexual reproduction also generally is timed for favorable conditions. So you have a mating season or seed production during a specific type of the year. Um, and this also allows for dispersal if you have some sort of structure involved such as uh, you know these winged samaras of oak trees, sorry, of maple trees, um, they're able to disperse further away from their parents. So this is favored in environments that have variable conditions. All right, disadvantages is that the offspring are are generally fragile. They aren't as they can be more fit than their parents but they can also be less fit than their parents, and many of them do not survive. Um, so usually the most fit will survive, but not all of them. The other disadvantage, it requires two individuals um, within favorable conditions for reproduction, so they have to have them enough resources each. Um, there's some sort of selection involved. They have to fall in love. Um, it also requires more resources. So for example, an avocado seed, which is produced um, by a, a pollinated or the fusion of sperm and um, egg of a plant, also is housed in a fruit. That fruit requires resources and <clears throat> it requires specific conditions in order for it to occur. That seed then has to germinate that uh, germinating seed then has to grow into a tree. All that requires a lot of time, effort, and um, resources. All right, so now we're going to get into plant reproduction and we'll talk about animal reproduction. So in plant reproduction, you have uh, different ways you can reproduce asexually and sexually. Uh, Self-fertilization is one way in which gametes are fused that come from the same individual. So this pea plant produces uh, pollen, which has sperm on it, and it produces um, uh, reproductive structures that produce eggs as well, right? Um, carpels or pistols. Um, and so it can take its sperm and uh, or its pollen and pollinate itself to produce a seed. So my question for you is this sexual or asexual reproduction? It only requires one individual. Um, but it also has uh, the fusion of gametes. Okay, so 
If we define sexual rep reproduction as the fusion of sperm and egg, then yes, this is sexual, even though it is um, taking place on a single individual. Okay, so when would this be advantageous or disadvantageous? So this was it takes the opportunities of asexual reproduction where you only need one individual. Um, let's say you're isolated by yourself, there's no other pollinators, um, there's no other individuals with flowers around. Um, you can just pollinate yourself and create another individual that way. Okay, it would be disadvantageous if there are other individuals around and uh, there are no mechanisms to block your self-fertilization. Okay, so it's better if you, ha if let's say you're in a variable environment where sexual reproduction is um, favored, but you don't have the mechanisms to block self-fertilization. So to prevent this, you have um, different things by plants, including what's called a dioecious plant. So that's a plant that produces only one type of gamete. So here we have flowers that are producing pollen and flowers that are producing um, the um, the ovule which contains the egg, the pollen which contains the sperm, and these are on different plants. So by producing only one, they can't self-fertilize. A carpellate plant is one that does not have um, carpels. A staminate plant is one that does not have the stamen that produces the pollen. Um, other types of plants are monoecious, meaning they have both um, carpels and stamens. Okay, so here's an example here. But they have other mechanisms for preventing self-fertilization. They can um, uh, mature at different times. So the pollen will mature maybe before the ovule or the carpal. They can be arranged for incompatibility for fertilization by a pollinator. So you see here the pollen is higher than here. So when a bee goes in this flower, and a bee goes in this flower, they're going to get pollen in different parts. So here they're going to get pollen on their butt. Here they're going to get pollen closer to their neck. And so then when it goes to a different flower, um, it won't um, fertilize its own flower. It can also have chemical rec recognition of its own pollen so that it can reject its own pollen and not um, create a self-fertilization that way. All right, asexually, um, plants reproduce through what's called vegetative reproduction, where um, fragmentation is one, um, one mode, where a piece of the plant breaks off, and that piece then is able to establish as its own separate entity and become a full-grown plant itself. And this can happen in uh, different, different ways. Roots um, may have roots that kind of shoot under the ground and then produce a new organism that way. Aspen trees do this and they create these aspen groves. And essentially all of these aspen trees are connected by their roots and are one organism with many different types of vegetative uh, fragments. You can also do through leaves. We showed that picture earlier of the plant that had little buds of leaves on it. Each of those little buds was just a vegetative fragment which can then disperse and become a new um, plant. Stems as well, so potatoes um, are actually uh, stems and they can shoot those stems out of different parts of the potato to produce new plants which then make more potato. There's also a a process called apomixis, which is the production of seeds without pollination. So dandelions do this. This um, did not require uh, fertilization to make um, and still has the benefits of being able to disperse. You can also have uh, cuttings where, let's say, a little piece of the plant can break off from the other. And this generally requires a callus, which is a mass of undifferentiated cells, kind of like stem cells, which then can differentiate into uh, stems and roots and other parts. So potatoes, Bartlett pears are examples of plants that can do this. As long as you have a piece of this 
massive undifferentiated cells, which can be found in different parts of a potato. You can cut up into a bunch of different pieces and each of those different pieces will grow into a new potato plant. There's some artificial um, ways we can stimulate vegetative reproduction, one of which is called grafting, where you can take off different branches, and as long as they, their xylem or their, their structure for conducting water and sugars in their stems is compatible, you can just stick it into a different tree, and then that will take on the life of that branch and start to reproduce, or start to grow as if it was in its own tree. Now you can have different species on the same tree grafted into different parts of the, the plant. In fact, there's a tree that is flowering with, I think, 40 different types of plants grafted into it in different areas. Generally, they have to be art, uh, related in order to do that. Um, but you can then grow different types of species within the same plant. Okay, so another way you can stimulate this artificially is you can take different little pieces of a plant um, and then place it into a test tube or some sort of a nutrient-filled auger and then grow it within that nutrient and hormone-laden little auger. Uh, so cloning, basically you're artificially cloning and this is called test tube cloning. And um, this usually takes some amount of research. You have to know which types of nutrients are needed and which types of hormones are needed. Um, but you can, yeah, this is generally done in the orchid trade where you have a specific orchid and you like the look of it. So this one down here, you can just um, take vegetative pieces and grow all these different orchids that are the same genetics and will produce the same flower. Now we talked about this in bio one, Gen you can genetically engineer plants. You can insert or remove genes into a plant. A uh, transgenic plant expresses genes from another species so you can move you know, specific types of disease resistance or pesticide resistance within um, into a, a different plant. And this creates a genetically modified organism. Another artificial technique is called protoplast fusion. This is where you take the cell wall off and you combine the two cells, you, you fuse their cellular membranes. So now you have, this could be two different species or it could be the same species, but you are able to combine them and now you have uh, two different uh, combination of genes that make one hybrid plant. All right, so now we're gonna shift gears and talk about animal reproduction, starting with sexual reproduction. Meiosis is the promise, process of forming gametes, the egg is generally large and non-motile, and then the sperm is generally small. Gametes then f fuse to make a diploid organism, the zygote. And most animals reproduce sexually, some asexually, and some both. Now, sexual reproduction often occurs only during a specific season, right? The mating season. Um, many organisms that especially live in seasonal environments have those different um, seasons in which they will mate. Ovulation is the release of an egg and this occurs in cycles as well. For humans, we are not seasonal animals. Um, females ovulate once every 28 days. Um, and somewhere in during that ovulation, there was a time in which that um, the, the woman is most fertile or most uh, receptive to a uh, fertilization event. So environmental cues generally cause ovulation, but however, some like polar bears are induced ovulators. So they usually won't ovulate until after mating. Um, there is also uh, hermaphroditism found in the animal kingdom where a individual has both uh, both the ability to produce sperm and egg. This is found generally in animals with limited opportunity to mate. So they may be found in an area where their species is rare or coming across another one of their species is very rare. Um, and you have different types of hermaphrodit hermaphroditism. First is simultaneous where all individuals exhibit both sexes at the same time. So examples of this are earthworms or sea slugs. And they generally 
have some sort of courtship ritual um, to ensure that, and it's very complicated, to ensure that both of them will release sperm, which, um, and both of, both of them can then <coughs> result in a fertilized egg. Um, there's also sequential hermaphroditism, which is <coughs> where a the an individual will sw switch sexes. <coughs> so this will happen in clownfish and other marine fish uh, species, where the largest individual at um, an area, for example, in a sea anemone will be the female, and then the lesser, smaller um, individual will be a male. Well, eventually that female will die, and when that female dies, the next largest male will become a female. So it will switch sex, and then uh, another female will come and become the male. Okay, so it's basically you know taking turns being the female. And there are other um, other complicated systems for marine fishes which are um, similar to that. Asexually, many animals can reproduce where they go through a process called fission, where it's a separation of a parent into two equally sized individuals. So you have here some sea anemones doing that right there. You also have budding where you have a smaller portion which outgrows from the parent individual and then breaks off to become a new organism and fragmentation so this occurs in sea star so as long as sea star gets this central part of the central disc it can form a new organism uh, after fragmenting so here's one leg of sea star and you can see it's growing one two three four five new new legs um, after being separated there's also a process of parthenogenesis now this is kind of rare in uh, animals and um, is highlighted in the documentary called Jurassic Park, where you have a female which produces an egg and ovulates, but that egg does not require fertilization in order to um, become um, a viable offspring. So essentially they have haploid individuals. Half of the genes um, are able to survive and reproduce. Um, well, they aren't haploid, they are diploid, but the, it is through the doubling of the gene um, of the chromosomes uh, within the, the egg itself. And both of those copies of genes are exactly like uh, the first copy, so they are clones. But sometimes this still requires mating behavior. So... Um, here you have these are two females and they have to take turns um, inducing what would be a male and female courtship ritual and what this allows to do is is it changes the hormones within or it correlates with hormones within the individuals to allow for ovulation and the production of that egg so is this sexual or asexual well because you do not have fusion of sperm and egg this would be an asexual form of reproduction so these lizards do that uh, not all lizards um, but this lizard does it um, and there are a couple other types of species and I'll let you look that up and we can answer that in class all right so that's it for reproduction